Christ's name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, we're going to go right to the book of Ezekiel this morning. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 3. We're not often in Ezekiel, um, but we are this morning to start us off. Now, if you've been tracking with us, you know that we're in the series on James right now. And this is week two in James. But we're going to start with this picture in Ezekiel because I believe God led me to this. So Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 1, it says, The voice said to me, Son of man, eat what I am giving you, eat this scroll, and then go and give its message to the people of Israel. Now, pause really quick. What in the world is going on here? So Ezekiel was an Old Testament prophet. And if you've read the prophets, you might know that Ezekiel is probably absolutely the weirdest prophet in all of Scripture. He gets the weirdest visions. It's just a bit of a weird book. And in chapter 3, you get a, another little weird scene. So the prophet, this is kind of the pastor. This is the person who cares about God's people, going to send them a message. And God starts and says, Ezekiel, I've got a scroll. I've got a book. It's paper. It's literal paper. And I want you to eat it. Now, can you see that scene for a second? Eating paper. Hopefully, he had something to wash it down with. Amen? Are you awake second service? Yeah. I mean, this is funny stuff. Like he's eating a book. He's going to eat a book. All right, verse two. So I opened my mouth and he fed me literally the scroll. Fill your stomach with this, he says. And when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Oddly, because that's not what you would expect paper to taste like. Verse four. Then he said, son of man, go to the people of Israel and give them my messages. I am not sending you to a foreign people whose language you cannot understand. So he's not a foreign missionary. He says, no, I'm not sending you to people with strange and difficult speech. If I did, they would listen. So God's saying to Ezekiel, the group of people that you're going to give my message to, they're not people that have never heard the voice of God before. They're not people where the gospel is new to them. Christianity is new to them. He says, if it was new, if it was fresh, they might actually listen. More humor in this passage. Are you getting it? They might actually listen because at least it would be fresh. At least it would be new. God says they might listen to the word that you're about to share, but not the group of people I'm about to share or that you're about to share with. Who are these people? These are the people who grew up in church. These are the people who have grown up listening. They, they, they've, they've grown used to the gospel. They've grown used to the message about God. And they've grown so used to it, they've gotten a little bit callous. They come in and they sit in the seats and, yes, pastor, yes, pastor. But none of it penetrates. But the people of Israel won't listen to you. And why won't they listen to you, pastor? Because they're not listening to me, God says. For the whole lot of them are hard-hearted and stubborn. So we got some easy, happy news for you this morning to start us off. They are, the whole lot of them, stubborn and hard-hearted. Many of us in this place, we've heard God so much that we've started to content ourselves with, I went to church, with, I heard the message. So what we're going to see in James today is he's, he's going to go right after that. So you can't just hear the message. You've got to look intently at the message. You've got to do what it says if it's actually going to change your life. But you see that in Ezekiel here. God says, eat this book. Eat this book. It's a big deal for us. COVID was a big deal. Amen? COVID? One of the reasons Pastor Ricky and I, and didn't Pastor Ricky just kill it last week? Um, so insightful, so helpful. We listened to uh, chapter one of James last week in the van driving back from Illinois because I was in Illinois seeing my family there. And we're driving along the roads, and I promise I didn't stare at the screen too much. Um, we did make it safely, but I got to hear um, everything that you guys heard and, and uh, just such a helpful message. One of the reasons uh, Pastor Ricky and I really wanted to do the book of James with you is because of the way he begins the book. He says that he's writing it to the 12 scattered tribes of Israel. 
to the people of God. The 12 tribes was a, it's, it's like a biblical code language for the people of God, Christians. And he says, I'm writing it to you and you guys are scattered out there. And he might have meant geographically, but I think it was more than that. I think, I think there's something about us that's a bit scattered right now. And that's our discernment as pastors because COVID was a bit of a thing. We studied some of the impact to COVID last year. One of the alarming stats that we heard was that in 2020, phone calls to mental health hotlines went up 890%. Did you know that? Last year. That's just an indicator. What's behind all that? Divorce filings last year went up 20%. And if divorce filings went up 20%. What's the number on broken divorces that are headed that way? Households that report anxiety and depressive disorder inside their households before it was 11%. 2020, it was 41%. 25% of people under 30 contemplated suicide last year alone. And the number for every other age group, it's one in 10 contemplated suicide last year alone. You look at the other statistics and other behaviors and addictive behaviors and, 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 and binging and, and, and out of control things spreading darkness into families. It all went up last year. And so I know a bunch of our focus was let's get physically through a pandemic and let's try to be physically healthy on the other side. And I'm looking around at a room like this and I know even online and, and, and some of us still lost people. And some of us are today even grieving the people that we've lost. But there's also the impact that's inside of us still. We're a bit of a mess. We're pretty broken. And it's interesting, it's like, you can say that and you can look around a room like this and everybody's like, yeah, pastor, you're right. Yeah, pastor, big smile on our face, but I'm fine, but I'm fine, and my family's fine. No, you're not. The statistics don't agree with you. And they're right and you're wrong. I win. Alter call. <laughs> All right? <laughs> it's not gonna be that short. But you get the point. We are broken. Whether we're admitting it or not, there are things that are going on back at home and it's deeper and it's bigger, right? And the marriage isn't where it's supposed to be and, and you and the kids isn't where it's supposed to be and the, the money's not where it's supposed to be. The career's not where it's supposed to be. Your physical health isn't where it's supposed to be. Your trust in God isn't where it's supposed to be. Because here's the other thing is while all that stuff has been breaking for us, people's relationships with God like we're starting to see the stats come in right now and, and the people who have left church and are probably not coming back to church is very, very high. And if people's relationship, even the people that are coming back to church, their frequency of attending church has gone way, way down. None of that is meant to, to condemn you this morning. Praise God that you're here. But our relationship with church has become shaky at a very vulnerable moment in our lives. And if our relationship with church is shakily, shaky, it's, it's not for sure, but it's probably an indicator that your relationship with God himself is shaky. And so James says, I'm writing what I'm about to write to the scattered people. So are you ready to admit that you're a scattered people yet? Because yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. And if he's writing to a scattered people, and if... If Ezekiel is eating a book <laughs> and he's going to a hard-headed people, it's probably for us. Amen? Whoo, so let's jump in. Let's jump in and we're going to go to James 1.16. And here's what you got to do as we go through this. Because we're a scattered people and because we don't want to just go through one more message and walk out unhealed again, which isn't in a word in English, but you don't want to be like, let's get healed. Let's get better. Let's have God come in and bring actual change. If we want that today, then let's be for real today. Amen. I mean, for real. 
Like, take notes. I'm not a note taker. Take notes anyway. There's a pen in front of you. That's by design. Take notes anyway. Write it down. Why? Because you remember things better. You engage mentally better the things that you write down. Make a few notes. Write it down. Get your, get your Bible out. Look up the passages with me. And you might want to amen today. Like, you might want to amen better than you just amen today. <laughs> amen. Amen. Like, you might want to clap. You might want to shout. You might want to grunt. I don't know what you're going to do. You better do it today, right? Because you all need to be in this with me today. You don't need to drift today. You don't need to doze today. Okay. Verse 16, James says, So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens, and he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. So let's begin with this, and I'm going to read through the rest of chapter 1 of James with us today, and I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. But he says, every good, every perfect gift that you have in your life, it only comes from one place, from God. Only one place. There you go. Amen. So only one place. So do you have maybe a roof over your head tonight? It means it came from him. Are you going to eat lunch today? You're already thinking about lunch. I know you are. You're going to eat lunch today. God's provided you with food. Amen. That came from him. So you got children in your life. Amen. From him. So you got education that helped you to get a job, that helped you to take care of those kids. Amen. 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 And it goes on and on. Got a car to drive. Amen. Some of us are struggling with that, but you've got other blessings that are in your life. Right? I'm not trying to come in here and say we've all got the same things. That's not the way that it goes. But everything that's good, look at your inventory of stuff and of blessings in your life. And all that inventory came from him. Yes. All of it. It's part of this worship thing that we do. Sometimes we, we get it wrong. Sometimes we think worship is just us singing songs with the team. And that was beautiful. Did that rock this morning? Wasn't that good? But that's not where worship stops. Every single moment you see anything good, anything good in your life, you know what you do? It's, it's a quick glance. That was from you, God. Yeah. That Father, that was from you. It, did, it didn't take but a half a second to say, Father, that was from you. Thank you, Lord. You provided that for me. You gave that to me. It could have been somebody else, but you gave that to me. Thank you, Lord. It's just, it's just like lightning, but that's a way to live, and I would highly recommend that as a way to live. Constant worship, and he does not change. Amen? Amen. Now you're starting to get it. That's awesome. Verse 18, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we out of all creation became his prized possession. Now there's, there's a bunch jammed into here, and I got to lay foundation for the rest of the passage. So you notice I put a box around true word because word is going to come up a bunch in the rest of this passage. He's going to talk about the word of God about five times. He's basically going to say, eat this book what he's going to say. James, the whole rest of this, eat this book. That's what he's going to say. True word. He's going to talk to us about our relationship with the Bible. That's what this is going to be. Now, true word, what's word there? I'm going to get weird and theological with you for just a second if, as I describe this. That is the Greek word logos. Say logos. Logos. Logos is this really interesting word in the Greek because what it means is it means word to, to speak. It means expression. It can be written or spoken. Anything that is expressed is the word. So in the beginning, when God created the world, he said, let there be what light? That was the logos of God. Logos. And then John 1 comes to creation and says, in the beginning was the word. word. And the word was with God and the word was was God. You know that from John 1.1. 1, 1. That's logos each time. So what's he saying? He's saying the expression of God is supernaturally in a way that's going to kind of break your brain today. It's Jesus. Jesus is the logos. And so I read the word of God in here and it's not just information. It's not just words on a page. What's happening is there's a supernatural power that's in the words, but beyond that, it's a supernatural presence in the words. So I don't just read the Bible, I let the Bible read me. 
it all gets a little bit weird, but it's how it works. So when he's talking about the word, he knows. He's got this little, like, smile of glee on his face, like I'm telling him about the Bible, but I'm telling him Jesus the whole time. Okay. Is that fun yet? So he chose to give us birth, chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we out of all creation became his prized possession. Just two more really fun things that are in there. God chose you. Do you see that? He chose you. I like that nobody had to twist God's arm to make me a Christian. I like that God looked over the planet and he chose me, loves me, right? Like that matters today. God loves you, chose you, and then he wants you to be his prized possession. That's, that's first fruits. It, it, you're special to God. You're a big deal to God. And James does this. James is about to hit us with a lot of difficult truth. Okay, he's about to, um, well, James is like the Gordon Ramsay of the New Testament. <laughs> and you're in Hell's Kitchen today. Congratulations. <laughs> James is not easy going. He's not going to stop and consider your feelings. James is hard hitting. That's what this book is known for. It's one of the reasons a lot of people really love this book and some people really hate this book because he is totally in your face. Now, you're never going to invite Gordon Ramsay over to your kitchen, right? Like ever. But if you ever did, if you ever did, the only reason that you would ever invite him over is because you desperately want to know the truth about your kitchen situation. And I know he'll tell me, yeah. right? <laughs> James is going to tell you for sure. But he starts here. He starts here and says, I'm going to give you a little bit of good news before we get to the hard stuff. And the good news is, right, that all your gifts in your life come from God. You're that loved. And then he chose you out of all creation and you're his prized possession. So when we come and, and we get all up in your business here, I want to start in this place of realizing how loved you are by this God. You matter to him. <laughs> okay, we keep going with Gordon here. All right, verse 19. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness to, that God desires. Did I tell you? Here he is. Bam! Every single conversation in your life you should be the last one to speak. But wait a second, that's not how it works. Like I'm sitting there waiting for them to get done with their things so I can jump in with my word, right? And then we're arguing over top of each other. And she's always telling me to wait until she's done talking before I start talking, but I don't want to do that because I want to be in power. And we are, we're always struggling with that. Could you imagine if you could just insert this one verse, just this one verse into marriages? Oh my goodness. Altar call, done. <laughs> right? Like, let's go. Like, we don't do that, right? Like, we are slow to listen. <laughs> we are quick to speak, and we're quick to get angry. <sighs> and that's real. James is like, don't do any of that. Uh, verse 21, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word that God planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. So yeah, get rid of all the filth. That's easy. No. Um, next, as you get rid of all the filth that's in your life, I want you to bring in. So that's, that's the cleanse out the bad and bring in the positive. Cleanse out, stop the behaviors. Stop all these things that have been killing you, COVID, this last year. Stop all that stuff. And bring the word of God in, and you've got to humbly accept the word that God put in your hearts because it's going to save you. Is, is the word of God true? Is the word of God true? Can you trust it today? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed by God onto the page, and it is all profitable for you. It's not just some of it sounds like I'm reading a phone book. Some of it sounds like ancient history. Some of it doesn't seem like it's as useful. No, it's all useful for you. All scripture is God-breathed. Verse 22, don't just listen to God's word. So he's going to go deeper into this God's word thing. 
Don't just listen to it. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are fooling yourselves. Again, James isn't trying to be nice to us. He says, you could just be in church today, maybe, and you're checking off the box on church, and you don't have any intention whatsoever of actually walking out this Christian life. You got Jesus, but, but you're not going to want to be like Jesus and willing to make the changes required for you to walk like Jesus in your life. You might just be fooling yourselves. I told you he wasn't necessarily nice, but sometimes we need to hear it. Verse 23, for if you listen to the word and you don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror and you see yourself and you walk away and you forget what you look like. Pastor James has got a great illustration here for us. He's like, it's like looking in a mirror. And it's interesting, in the ancient world, they didn't have hardly any mirrors. It wasn't a common thing for them to have. They knew what they were, but most folks, especially the poor folks, did not have those. And mirrors weren't like what they are today. They weren't smooth glass. They were usually metal that was, that was smoothed out and shined to a certain level. And then people could see kind of a vague reflection of themselves. But most people in the ancient world, they didn't actually even know what they looked like. So he's like, if you have a chance to look in this vague kind of mirror... Just realize as soon as you leave that, it's really easy to forget the little thing that you saw there. And he's going to talk a bit more about not just glancing, but looking deep into the word. Stay in there, germinating for a while, because you need to. But first he says, you can just look and walk away. And if you just look and you just hear God's word, but you don't do anything, you walk away from it, it didn't do anything for you. So let's play this out. I mean, in our lives, we look at the mirror, what, like 10 times a day? And then you got your smartphones, and then it's selfies, and how did I look from that angle, you know? All that. But it's like, but you walk up to a mirror, and you look, and let's just say for the sake of argument that, especially for you older ones like me, maybe there's been a, a bit of a nose hair situation that's been going on. <laughs> just saying. Like, Maybe. And maybe nobody's told you about it. And maybe you walk up to that mirror at the end of the night. It's been a long day. And, and you know, and, and don't you do this? You're like, you've got this visual thing of yourself, like, like, I'm looking good. Like, I know I'm looking good. I'm super, super confident. And you hit that mirror. It's like, oh, boy. And there's that nose hair. Four inches it's grown down. I mean, it's just like <laughs> massive. How did I even eat with that thing there? And you got that deal, right? Like, let's just keep it there. And you see it, you're disgusted, but you walk away, you don't pluck it. I J would respond to that. You know what? Siri? <laughs> Siri's into it, all right. Um, Right, now the internet, they know everything. Um, so four inch, I walk away. James is like, this is how people are who read God's word and they don't do anything. He's not just saying, do you look at the mirror and take in information and walk away and forget the information? No, that's not his point. His point is, if you didn't do anything about it, it had no use. That's what he's, pluck the hair. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pluck the hair. Um, 25. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. I love that he calls it the perfect law that sets you free. Why? Because when we hear the word law, we think it's something that binds us up. But the law of God has this different way about it, and it always works this way. And if it's not working this way in your life, you're doing it wrong, by the way. The perfect law of God should set you free. How does the law set me free? Well, you know, like when you're in England, you drive on what side of the road? The left side. Left side. And everybody does. The law keeps us safe, does it not? And then when you're in America, you drive on what side of the road? Now we got it. We were confused about England. I get it. 
But if we all obey that law, then we will all be free of accidents. Amen? So this is the perfect law of God that is meant to set you free into blessing. That's what he's saying. Set you free into blessing. Um, Psalm 1 has this picture. And it talks about, it talks about the Bible and it talks about what, how this is supposed to look in your life. Like if you do what James says and you really get into God's, God's word the way that you're supposed to, um, Psalm 1, and this is verse 2, it says, but these kinds of people, they delight in the law of the Lord and they meditate on God's words day and night. Like they just can't stop thinking about it. They just, they just keep. And they are like trees planted along the riverbank bearing fruit each season and their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. It's such a powerful picture to me because like, have you ever seen um, an oasis in the desert? Not, I mean, not personally, but like pictures and stuff, right? <laughs> like you see the oasis and the thing is the desert is hostile to any kind of growth the climate and everything like that, it's hostile. But you get to the oasis, and all of a sudden there's vegetation. There might be trees there. Why are there trees? Why is there vegetation? Because there's a water source, right? And if there's a water source, then everything's okay. But only in the oasis, not anywhere else. Amen? Come on, folks. Not anywhere else. You've got the water in the midst of hostility, and you're still good, and you're good forever. That's the picture here of people who make God's word a huge part of their lives. You read the Bible, you take it in, you do what it says like James is talking about, and you will be blessed by it. You will be unstoppable. Verse 26, if you claim to be religious but you don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. So this is your day-to-day -day speaking to your spouse, your kids, your roommates, everybody around you. You can... You can be a theologian. You can be involved in all the church stuff. But if your tongue is out of control, here's why this is, this is a struggle for me. Like, I don't know. Like, if there was a Christianity rating, right, like on how good of a Christian I am, in here, in this church, what you guys see on a Sunday morning, I might rate at a certain place, Josh Trueblood. But you ask my family, who sees me behind closed doors, and you say, how's he keeping a tight rein on his tongue? There. That rating goes down a bit, amen? Amen. amen. And that's what James is going after. You got to tame your tongue. That's actual religion. Altar call. Done. We're going to do a whole message on taming the tongue in chapter 3 because he goes back after it. Verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So, so he's, James started with worship, started by encouraging us, telling us who we are before God, told us all this stuff about eating the book, eating the Bible, eating the word. And then he says, and if you do all of that, you land here at this place where you're no longer fooling yourselves but you have true and genuine religion. It actually came into your life. Faith, the right kind of faith, real faith actually came into your life. And then he describes it in two ways. And it's so uh, pivotal to me. It, 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 he says there's two pieces to it. Like you'll actually care about the poor now if you have real faith. You'll care about widows and orphans and you'll do stuff for them. But the other side is also true and just as true your own character and the purity of your own life will also be like Jesus. So you'll start to see shift here and here. And it's pivotal for me because isn't it weird how in our current political environment, now he's talking about politics, just for a second. Do you notice how folks who, and not all, but some, who lean toward the liberal, liberal spectrum. They care much about social justice and the poor, but they would not like to talk about who you sleep with at all or your personal life. And those who lean toward the conservative end, not all but some, would like to talk very much about who sleeps with who, 
but let's not talk about social justice and the poor. James comes in and says, God has balance. And if you're going to have a real faith, it's got both pieces to it. Do you see the sanity of God in an insane world? Just a fun little thing for you. Eat the book. We need the Bible. And we need to trust the Bible. That's going to be step one. As James is going to say, accept the Bible. Accept the truth of God's word. It's not lost on me that if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, the very first words of the enemy, the serpent in the garden, do you remember what they were? He says, did God really say? He walks up to Eve at the tree, and God had said, you're not supposed to eat from this tree. A really simple thing, right? You can have all the trees, every tree, all this variety. God is a God of abundance. God is the God that gives us all kinds of options. He does. All of these are blessing to you. There's just one. You got to stay away from that one. That one will hurt you. Serpent comes right in, stands at that one tree with her and says, did God really say? The first attack aggressively of the enemy against mankind is to cause us to doubt God's word. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure what God said to you is true or helpful. Does the enemy ever come into your life and speak that way? Can you actually trust what the Bible says to you today? It's an ancient book, 66 books, in fact. Uh, this was written a long time ago. Did, did, did those books, did those authors actually have our current culture in mind? Like, it's so outdated, right? Like, we can, like, not only even culturally and, and morally, but scientifically, it's like, can we even trust? And, like, maybe you shouldn't trust. And maybe what you should do is you should go to the Bible with a pair of scissors. And maybe you should keep some pieces and not the others. The problem with that is you go to the book of Revelation, and there's a spot where it's talking about the book. And it says, no one should ever, ever take away words that are in the book. No one should ever, ever add any words to the book except for what's been written. Because sometimes, sometimes we, in our Christianity, we make the opposite error. We're not taking anything away, but sometimes we take our church traditions and we take our weird little subculture of Christianity and we try to write that into God's word. I remember growing up in a, in a church that said you can't ever drink alcohol. Where'd you get that from? There's actually not a verse. So why would you add that? Well, I had a conviction, or we had this family member who was an alcoholic, and it was a struggle for them. Good, then. You should have a conviction, and you should walk in love, and you should do these things. But don't go and take your conviction and hold it at the same authority as Scripture. They're not the same. You can't take words away from the book with your pair of scissors, and you can't add words to the book that you wish were in there. Don't do either one. You read the book, and you let the book read you. You take it as it is. It is the word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for you. Timothy Keller said this. He says, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. It's supposed to change us. Okay, so James is saying, read, read the Bible, eat the book. He gives us three ways to do it. The very first one is he says, we were born again by the true word. Do you remember that? I'm going to give you a, kind of an outline for this passage. Um, Bible geeks like me, we love stuff like this. Because you're reading a passage in James like this, and it, and it feels like he's hopping to a lot of different topics, and you're trying to see what it is that he's saying. What he's doing here is he's teaching us about God's word and how to take it into our lives. And he makes three big points, and you see it there, 18, 21, and 25, get born again by the word of God, humbly accept the word of God, and look carefully into the word of God and do what it says. Those are the big three, and you're going to see that slide again because I'm going to spend the rest of the message going over those three in a little bit more detail, a little bit more depth. The very first one, you got to get born again by the word of God. Say, how does a book get me born again? Here's how. It's the gospel. 
It's the gospel, the truth of God. Jesus Christ logos, right? Like he gets us the truth of who God is. Like it's not karma. Praise God it's not karma. Because karma is all about like, what have I done and what's the, what's the universe gonna bring back to me? Because if that's what it was, it's a bad day for me. I don't know about you, but it's a bad, bad day for me. I want grace. So what's the gospel? The gospel comes in with the truth and says, this is the truth. Take a verse like John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, including you. So basic, so simple. God so loved the world, including you, that he gave his only son. And what does that mean? Well, it means Jesus came down and he lived the life that we live. It means that he had to walk around in our shoes and, and, and feel what it was like to be in our skin. He had to be tempted by us and feel our pressures and stresses and all the kind of stuff. He, he considered it worth it to do that. And then he died on a tree for you, died on a cross for you. God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes, believes. You know how simple that is? Now, whoever earns their way to God, whoever attends church this often and we're tracking you, none of that, whoever believes, that sounds so simple. No, you go to God and you surrender just like the thief on the cross did and said, would you remember me today when you come into your kingdom? This is the most broken, simple sinner's prayer in the world. That guy didn't know theologically hardly anything. How in the world did he get into heaven? He got in. But he got in. Jesus, you got to forgive me. Jesus, I'm all broken. Jesus, I can't earn any of this. You're right, you can't. Jesus, forgive me. Bring me into the family of God. I want to go to heaven. Jesus. Like that, that. And that's it. And that's enough. And you're like, but that's too simple and that's too easy. Yes, it is. And that's the, that's the stumbling block of the gospel that some of us stumble on. It's meant to be easy. Why? Because it's nothing that you've done. All the work, all done by him. That's what the cross was. And so it's supposed to be easy and simple. Has to be. Otherwise, you'd become an instant Pharisee. You'd get a big head about your Christian self and you'd start pushing other people down almost immediately. And God's got the resolution for that. So it's, it's his gospel. And some of you never heard that gospel before. Go read John 3.16 again. It's right there. So we get born again by the word. It's Jesus coming in through those words and saying, I'm the presence that made those words real. And I'm the presence that'll come in and change you. Some of you guys walked down an aisle before. You, you've responded to an altar call before, and it was never real for you. you got to beg Jesus today. Jesus, I need you to come in and make it real for me today. The gospel. Next, James says, not only get born by it, but you got to humbly accept it. you got to read it, you got to believe it, and you got to let it shape you. you. might be like, why do I have to let the Bible shape me? And the reason is, is because everything else in your life is already shaping you. It's just shaping you all out of whack, right? Like I'm not the only preacher in your life. And I don't mean Christian preachers. I mean news commentators. They're preaching to you every day. And some of you, you're giving them hours of your day. You're giving them hours of your week. And you're letting those folks tell you exactly what the nature of truth is. They're telling you what morality is. Don't, don't lie to yourself. They're preaching at you. And they're forming your view of reality. They're telling you about what's going on in society. They're telling you about how you're supposed to see family and how you're supposed to see the poor. They're telling you all of that stuff and you're allowing them to educate you, to tell you, to shape you. It's already happening. None of us is neutral. You didn't wake up this morning with an original thought. I'm, right? Neither did I. You're not saying amen as much as you were in the beginning of the message. <laughs> the influencers are influencing you. They're telling you on Instagram what beauty is. They're telling you what your worth is every single time they click like. Every one of you that's on Facebook and they're commenting and you're counting your comments and you're checking in and 
What are you doing? You're, you're, you're letting them influence your idea of who you are and your personal worth. I mean, that's, that's another message for another time. But the amount of, 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 of mental health that's all associated with social media right now, I mean, it's, it's, it's shocking. But we're letting the influencers influence us. And we've got videos that are showing us how marriages are supposed to, are supposed to act and, and, and what healthy marriage looks like and what healthy family looks like. They're showing us everything. They're defining justice for us in culture. The influencers are, influencers are. And I'm not saying be disconnected from culture. I'm saying the voice of God must be louder. Culture has to be here. The commentators have to be here. The influencers have to be here. And God's got to be here. I'm like, why do I have to be in the word? Because you're everywhere else. And he's got to come in, clean all that nonsense up in you because it's nonsense, right? Can we admit it? I mean, sometimes we just feel like we're just being pulled back and forth like crazy. It's just God's the sanity in a chaotic world. Another reason you need to accept the word of God is because you have forgotten what God is like. Back to presence, back to logos. You've forgotten the nature of the person that you worship and that you follow. Took this trip to Illinois this last week and got to see my mom who's been fighting cancer all year long and she's almost done with all of her treatments. Amen. Amen. Man, it's awesome. Terry Trueblood, you're right there online. She watches every single week. It's amazing. And she has faced chemo and she has faced surgery and she is, faced, she is almost done with her um, radiation treatments. Almost done. And she looks strong and she talks strong. And it's great to see that did, did, just did so much for my heart. I saw it at Christmas, and it was, a, it was a very short visit and wasn't as encouraging. She's just in such a strong place right now, and I feel so much peace to see that. So I got to swing into Illinois, and just like the rest of my family has been caring for her this whole last year, I got to swing in and just say, give me a week. You all stay home. Take a vacation. I'm going to go with her. What a blessing. So we're partying, right? Like we're doing all our stuff. And I'm having conversations, and I haven't seen a lot of this family in over a year. And here's the weird thing that happens. I don't know if you're like this, but like I remember what they were like and how they talked, but there's so much that I forgot, and I don't know that I forgot it. And I'm sitting there, and I'm having the conversation, and it's like I forgot that her mouth curled into that kind of smile when she talks about this topic. <laughs> right? Like I forgot it. It's like, there it is. And it's like, there's all this detail that just kind of got shoved off to the side. It's almost like we take our pictures and then we hit the Instagram filters on top of them and everything kind of glows and softens up and you don't see any of the wrinkles and stuff. You know what I'm talking about. But the wrinkles are true. Right? And the detail's true. And, and truth is better. So anyway, I, I didn't know your face crinkled that smile like that. Forgot. So fun. And then I'm looking at my sister, my older sister, Nikki, and, and Nikki's sitting there talking and doing stuff. And I forgot that like 90% of her mannerisms are Gracie Trueblood, <laughs> my youngest. All this stuff, it was just, it went on all, all weekend. We do that. Some of you lost people and they're in heaven right now and you're looking forward to the day that you're gonna meet them again. And for some of you, it's been maybe decades since you've seen that person. And that person, the further away that they are from you, it's like it, there's a lot that you've forgotten. And when you meet them again and you have your reunion and it's heavenly coffee, which that coffee is going to be so good, right? And you're sitting down over some heavenly coffee and you talk to them, your mind is going to be flooded with all this stuff that you had forgotten about them. And, it, and truth, truth is going to be beautiful. And it's going to be wonderful. We do that with God. We don't read his word. And we're out of his word. And we start to, without even meaning to, we start Instagram filtering God. And we start rounding off the corners. And, and we, we, we get a wrong view of him. We get a wrong view of his views. And it's something about getting into the Bible again. And you start to read his words actually. No filter. 
You read his words actually. You eat the book. When you start to do that, all of a sudden you start to see things and you're like, I forgot that was there. I forgot God was like that. I forgot he wasn't just mercy all the time and nice, nice, nice to me. Sometimes he's truth, truth, truth to me. Whoa. I didn't realize Jesus got so fired up about these kinds of people. Oh, I don't want to be that kind of person. I didn't realize Jesus was so loving to the outcast. Wow. And all of a sudden, he starts to shape things for you. And he starts to shape things in the way of truth, not the way they've already been shaped for you. Because you've forgotten. And you go back to that. This is the experience I have. This is for real my walk and the way that I come to the Bible. I'm always feeling this all, all the time. Like, God, I forgot you. God, I forgot you were this way. But I need that. I need that because it will keep me there with the actual Jesus. Yes. Not with the version I've made up because we're all doing it. Yeah, eat this book. Next, last way we have to eat this book is you got to do what it says. So we do this thing called spiritual gluttony. Say spiritual gluttony. Spiritual. All right, we're almost there, folks. We're almost there. <laughs> spiritual gluttony. Um, so this is a really big church people issue. Um, if you're new to the faith, you may not be into this yet, but hopefully you can follow what I'm talking about. Um, so we'll do this thing as Christians where we'll listen to a Bible teaching and we think we're done. Box checked. And we'll move on to the next Bible teaching. And sometimes we'll fill our whole week up with all these different Bible teachings because we think that the more Bible we get in and the more Bible we eat, the better of a Christian we are. And all you're doing is looking at mirrors. You're not actually doing what any of them tell you. And you're looking so much and it's like, oh, you know, then I saw this YouTube clip of this pastor and then I heard this thing on Christian radio and then I went to this other devotion and then I went to this other class and by the time you get to the end of a week, you've had 15 different little mini lessons to you. And you're like, that's so good. Isn't that good? No, it's not good. I know that seems weird, but no, it's not good. Why? Because James says, it's not in the hearing of the word, it's in the doing of the word that you experience change. You gotta do it. And here's the real danger that's underneath it all. When we listen to 15 mini messages and we don't respond to any of them, we don't actually change and repent with any of them, we grow a callous over our own soul. And we start to get used to the idea that God speaks and I don't listen. God speaks and I don't do. And that starts to become my normal Christian life. It starts to become my normal church life. And once I start getting used to that, I stop listening to any kind of truth, right? Now I got to respond. And I got to respond every time. Eat this book. All the way. You got to do what it says. Don't fool yourself. So how does this work? Like, you took notes today. Thank you for taking notes today. But maybe in this message, there was a, a particular thing and you just heard the Holy Spirit come in, you just felt something in your spirit. There was this just real small nudge at this one particular part, and you're like, that one was my part. That one was my part. And, and when I know which part was my part, you know what I do on Monday morning? I don't open up a devotional and start on something new because then I've lost my part from Sunday. James says, do what it says. Okay, so what do I do now? Now I wake up on Monday morning and I pull out my notes again and I know my shoe's untied right now, so it's okay. So you've been staring down my feet for like the last five minutes. <clears throat> you wake up on Monday morning, you pull those notes back out again, and you say, God, in prayer, because you're the living logos. You're the presence behind the words. So Jesus, right now, I don't want to just read the word. I want you to read me. So come and read me. And what is it? What was that nudge, God? Was that thing that you wanted? Help me go deeper with that. I don't understand it. Well, I don't understand it, okay? Then you call up your life group leader and you call up your Sunday school leader and you call up your pastor and you say, I need you to give more scripture on this because it's God that's speaking to me, not you. No offense to you, but it's God that's speaking to me and I'm on a road with him. 
give me some more scripture. Let me, let me get deeper into this. And I just start praying, and God, you need to show me. You need to evaluate me. You need to x-ray me. And when he does and he shows you, you do the thing. And scripture's changing your marriage. Scripture's, it's, it's all of it. And you start to build this brand new habit into your life. Just like James says, where it's like, I'm gonna do what it says every time. And I'll wait and I'll focus and I won't just let the next message in. I'm gonna deal with that. And maybe on Tuesday, you're journaling, right? We got soap journals out for sale in the lobby because some of you guys need to be journaling through James. And the whole point in journaling is uh, I just want God to speak to me. I'm gonna read a, a, a chapter of scripture, but what's the verse, God, that you've got for me today? And I'm gonna act on that. If you wanna build this stronger into your life, go out and get one of those soap journals. It'll help you. It'll just help you get started. You can do this. <clears throat> You want some good news? I got a little bit of good news for you. If you do all these things, if you do all these things, there's three results James promises to us. Number one, you'll be set free. He says that in 25. The law that gives you freedom, remember? You'll be set free. Number two, you'll be blessed if you do these things. Blessed by God. So you're like, we've tried five different books to heal our marriage and none of them has. Stand at the feet of God himself and say, God, this is my marriage. You're the one that knows the skeleton key that will unlock this thing finally. So I need you, you'll be blessed. And then finally, your faith and religion will be real. It won't be, you won't be fooling yourself anymore. Would you guys stand? pray. We can be stubborn and hard-hearted, and we can let the Word of God be spoken and pass us right by, and we can say, man, that was a good message this morning. It's not what this is for. It's that you would change. God loves you that much. Eat this book. <laughs> Eat this book. And we're coming out of COVID and we're broken and we're a mess. And some of you, you're ready to admit that to yourself maybe for the first time. And so God, if I'm a mess, how do I get healed? If I'm a mess, if things are broken, how do they get put back together again? How do I get on a better road? Am, am I going to let God tell me what that is? Not the influencers, not the commentators. Would you guys go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes? Because, Lord, we used to read the Bible. We used to come to you in the morning with our Bible open, and it used to be our favorite time of the day. We used to listen to it in our car and we didn't do the news in the commute on the way to work. We listened to the Bible. We used to do that. We used to care. We used to repent. We used to do all those things. And God, I want to do that thing again. This is a prayer where I'm about to pray over you guys. It's a prayer of dedication. If you want to be part of this prayer of dedication, I'm going to ask you to raise a hand. I'm going to ask you to raise it boldly and to raise it high because this is a step for you that, God, I mean business. I'm real. I'm, I'm in this. Raise those hands right now all over the room. I feel it. I feel it with you. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray a prayer of dedication right now, Lord, and we admit that we're broken. We admit that we're a mess, Lord. We admit that we miss you and we miss the real you and we need the word of God back in our life again. And so God, would you come and bring that change to us? Lord, we see all of our priorities and we see our, all of our schedule that's before us right now. And we ask that the Spirit of God would come in and just right before our mind's eye, we just start reordering things. We just start seeing it reordered. We'd start seeing it to take shape. This is how we're gonna start living our lives right now so that the Word of God can come in. The volume of God can be louder than any other volume. 
go Siri again. Lord Jesus, we struggle now with faith because we've wanted to change before and sometimes the change didn't come. Be the power, Lord, that can change us. We throw ourselves before you and we ask God, come and change us. You're always good, Lord. You're always saving. You're always truthful. God, we're, we're your prized possession, Lord. We love that. We love you, Lord. We love you so much. In Christ's name, amen.